So, it's five in the morning. Dan's not doing good. We're at 8,200 feet, 8,300 feet roughly. And uh, he was struggling coming up the trail. So we got him here, got him into bed. He slept, passed out real, real hard for an hour or two. But apparently he's just been moaning, got chest pain. Um, so, I think, I think we need to call somebody. I think we're gonna Tell him I puked. put in a call <clears throat> to get him I, out of here. Tell him I burped. Yeah, he barfed pretty good, man. Oh. Oh. This is the worst pain of my life, man. Oh. Oh. <coughs> oh. Hi, I'm at the North Rim Trailhead, just outside of Jacob Lake. Okay. Uh, we just hiked out of the Grand Canyon today, uh, well, last night, and my buddy is in distress. He's got some pretty severe chest pain, and uh, oh. I think we might need to get him out to some sort of help. About five in the morning, I woke up to hearing Dan just moaning in a lot of pain. And uh, so I got up and started to, you know, get, get dressed as best I could and checked on him. And it was, it was very clear that the situation was, was quite serious. So you're at the North Kaibab Trailhead? Correct. And he's conscious? He's conscious. He just vomited. He's been trying to sleep fitfully all night, but he has severe chest pain. The North Rim is closed. I know, so yeah. I don't know how <coughs> There's... long it's going to take. The transport is the issue. Just uh, a moment for me. I'm going to get somebody paged out to you, okay? Hold okay, yes, me. thank you. This is like Dan. Epic, this would be Epic Trails, like, <coughs> best episode. Dan, <laughs> you're, you're a trooper, man. We're obviously going to get some help. So don't add the stress of having to hike back across the damn Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yep. <laughs> You're gonna be okay, man. Oh, God. Oh. Just stay calm, try to stay relaxed. You got this, Dan. We're with you. Oh, thank you so much, Eric. At this point in the story, we need to back up a second, and I need to tell you how we got here. So about a month ago, I started making plans with Dan to go do something cool. He wanted to come out to Arizona, and I proposed the idea, let's do a rim to rim to rim backpacking trip. The rim to rim to rim trip is a 45 mile hike where you start at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, hike across the main corridor to the north rim, and then you hike back across to the south rim. This trip is a bit of a beat down for anybody, any time of year. It's obviously winter, which poses some massive challenges. And I've backpacked with Dan a bunch before and while I knew that it would push him, as it would push myself and every other hiker that tries to attempt something like this, I genuinely believed that this was well within all of our skill sets. The rim to rim to rim backpacking trip is a classic and it's a challenge in the best time of year, but in the winter when the north rim is covered in eight or nine feet of snow, it presents a whole new set of challenges. Day one, Dan and I hiked 14 miles from the South Rim, past Phantom Ranch, and on to Cottonwood Camp. Good freaking work, dude. That was a beast of a day. By the end of day one, we were utterly exhausted, and it was pretty much the normal butt kicking that the Grand Canyon is so fond of providing. When I called you about this, were you like, mm, I don't no, think not at I'm all. doing an Epic Trails again? No way, I was like, we're gonna do a, a bike in the Grand Canyon. I don't even think I let you get it out of your mouth. I was like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Pretty much went down like that. Now I'm regretting every bit of it. But... <laughs> now I immediately regret my decisions. We got into camp after dark. We made dinner and just passed out as soon as we could. 
And in the morning, we prepared for the next seven miles, which even though it's a much shorter duration, the conditions on the North Kaibab Trail are very difficult. And we knew that we were gonna be encountering ice obstacles and snow and landslides and all sorts of things that were gonna slow us down that were gonna make this trail very challenging. This is wild. I'm thinking I never saw anything like this in Wisconsin. And uh, I'm thinking we gotta have a really good plan because that ice could break at any second. And the trail just kept getting crazier and harder and slower. I think I got it. Man. It's just us the rest of the way, no one else. That was a rock slide. That was a rock slide. Everybody else has turned around there. <sighs> Why did I just get emotional going over that? Did that you? was really weird, yeah. Really? Yeah. What do you feel? I don't know. What kind of emotion? Huh. I don't know. That was crazy. Like this bond that uh, <laughs> I think, if I, didn't, I... if I saw correctly, you're your foot slipped, land gave way. I grabbed you, pulled you up. <laughs> pulled me into the arms of safety. Yeah. Oh, <sighs> man. We just reached new heights in our friendship. Oh, why, and did, I, why did I even say anything? <laughs> <laughs> like, what was... <laughs> that was really weird. Is it on the positive side? Uh, yeah, positive, oh, I think. Okay. Yeah, okay. just like... Well, that's, a good, that's a good thing. Like, that is so outside of my comfort zone. Yeah. Whew. Good job, dude. Let's go. Dan, knuckle bumps. Here we go. You don't see rock slides like that in Wisconsin. <laughs> no, there's probably not enough vertical relief for that. And we hit a spot called the Supai Tunnel. And here is basically the gateway to the North Rim. <sighs> That's so gnarly. <laughs> oh, God, dude. Look, at, look at this thing. What? Look at that. What is How that? the hell do we get out of there? We need a snowblower. Yeah, bust we, out that we flex tail. <laughs> oh, this is intense. So below the tunnel, it's more sunny, the snow melts faster, but above the tunnel, it is a winter wonderland and the snow was six, seven feet deep at this point and it was time to put on snowshoes. Snowshoeing in general is really exhausting. Snowshoeing through deep snow when you're setting the track with backpacks is another level of exhausting. At this point, things start to slow down and deteriorate. The trail on the North Rim is buried under eight feet of snow. It is very challenging to even understand where the trail is or where it goes. Breaking trail is a challenge. Doing so in the dark is a pretty scary thought and I wanted to get us out as fast as we can. Dan is starting to fall farther and farther behind. Darkness is setting in. I can tell that Dan is struggling, that he's starting to get a little nervous, and I'm starting to get a little nervous too. We try to keep things light, we try to keep things humorous, you know, not to let the situation start to overwhelm us. So, we're at a pretty, we're at a pretty tricky spot in the night. It's, it's dark. It's, uh, we didn't make our goal of getting out of the canyon before dark. So we're hustling as fast as we can. The snow is deep. We're snowshoeing now. It's massively difficult. Dan's back here with me. We're struggling, but we're gonna do this. We're gonna do it. We got it. We're gonna do it. <laughs> we're traveling at about a quarter mile an hour and that really alarms me. This isn't normal exhaustion. This isn't normal levels of fatigue. And I am thinking through all of the possible scenarios that might be going wrong. I think Dan might be having altitude sickness. 
I think that this might be putting stress on his heart, and I'm worried that Dan is having a heart attack. Having a rescue here at the North Rim is a massive challenge. That just seems daunting and impossible, so I'm doing my best to get Dan to the trailhead. And I'm thankful that Dan is at this point still pushing on, persevering, pushing through massive amounts of pain, and getting himself out to the trailhead. After several hours in the dark, I see Jake make his way back down to me, and he starts helping me get Dan out, and he's left Emmett behind at the trailhead. So Jake and I decide that we'll split up once again. I'll move on. I'll leave Dan and Jake to get out of the canyon. I'll go back, tell Emmett what is happening, and I'm gonna set up Dan's tent so that when he gets up there, we can immediately get him into a tent, get him into a warm space, get him into a sleeping bag, and hopefully get him to sleep. Dan passes out immediately and falls asleep for a good hour and a half while the rest of us make dinner and just kind of process through what might happen. I go to bed and I'm awoken at about five in the morning to Dan just screaming in pain. And here we are back in the rescue. I get, don't worry about it, Dan. Just stay relaxed. Nope, that just looks like good old fashioned vomit. <laughs> That's a good sign. The regular stuff. <clears throat> Hello, this is Eric. Hi, Eric. This is 911. Yeah. I'm letting you know that we do have a single ranger on location at the North Rim who is responding. Okay, he excellent. I want you to be aware that he has an approximate 25 minute ETA. Okay. And that there's no ambulance service out of the park. The only way out of the park from that location would be air ambulance if it's necessary. Okay. Um, now he is, you know, a qualified, um, our rangers are multifaceted, so he'll be able to assist and then assess you from there or assess your friend from there. Okay. Um, but if your friend's condition changes or worsens before he gets there, I yeah. need you to call me back at 911 immediately. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and how is he doing right now? Right now, the, the, the pain the pain has improved. Uh, where we're at a 10 out of 10 in the pain scale, down to a three or a four. So I think he, he just vomited and uh, uh, the, the pain is reduced. And I think just talking to <clears throat> emergency services also de-stressed the situation at, at some level. I, I think so. That. Yeah. Just try to keep him comfortable, let him rest in the most comfortable position. If his condition changes or worsens, give me a call back immediately, okay? My name is Jennifer, and I'm here till 6. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. Absolutely. Are they going to have to airlift me out of the park? Is that what they're saying? <clears throat> so, there's a park ranger here yep. that is aware and is been made aware of the of what's going on he's going to come out he or she is going to come out and uh it's going to take about 20 to 25 minutes for them to get here <clears throat> that person does have some medical training and so we're going to take a look and uh make an assessment if we do need to evacuate you it's going to need to happen through a helicopter oh, God. oh man just just focus on remaining calm. We got some help coming. The ranger's gonna be able to do a little bit better assessment than I can. <coughs> and and we'll make decisions. Don't don't think ten steps down the road, because the mat the, the point being is that you're gonna be okay. We'll figure it out. Who's the trip leader here? Uh, uh, trip leader? Yeah, you come with ride with, ride with us up to the uh, yeah. I was, uh, that was the worst, it was the worst pain in my life. I've had an appendectomy before. That was nothing compared to this. Here you go. Yeah. I'm gonna get some aspirin ready. Yeah. Hey, do you have any drug allergies? No. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes I do. Penicillin and moxicillin. Like how about aspirin? No. Got it.
tell you were having a heart attack, man. So once we make a few more, a few more diagnostics, then we're going to make a transportation decision. Okay. Yeah, it's only an EKG. Like nothing's sticking out. Nothing, nothing is, is showing that like you're having like an MI. Yeah. Nothing is showing. But however, like I don't know why you're having chest pain. That, that's certainly you know, very concerning. And so like I would definitely recommend being seen by a physician. Things that we see when people hiking across the canyon do. Like issues we see things like hypotremia, rhabdomyolysis. Uh, yeah. Is that your chest pain right now? Yeah. How bad? One to ten. Twenty six. Six. Do you want something for the pain? No. Uh -huh. Oh God. Do I can throw up at all? No. Ugh. I think the best option is to get out of here. Oh, yeah. yeah, I know. Uh, not great. Um, so the thing is, like, you know, I'm concerned for the chest pain you're having. I'm not seeing anything in EKG, but the fact you're having waves of chest pain is, is obviously not good. Is not that bad. altitude related, do you think? I haven't seen that. Yeah, I, mean, I, can, I can call Mexico's doctor and see what they think as well. So. Why would it happen? I don't know. As I'm hiking up on a canyon. Well, like you know, altitude, physical yeah. exertion, uh, you know, a lot of factors. Oh, you're good. Uh, transportation options would be we fly you out, uh, or we wait a long time, and then uh, and once the road is clear, it could be clear, I mean, it could be hours and hours, you know, take you out by a normal vehicle, and then uh, keep a Jacob leg and, and try to run you through with the county. And if we do it on the road, the fastest it will happen is three hours. That's if there's no big drift we have to, yeah. have to dig through. That's yeah. this could turn into a six-hour drift. Yeah. So update here. We got the park rangers have picked up Dan, and uh, we've been doing an assessment in the ambulance. Dan's currently okay. Um, he is having significant chest pains, and that's concerning to everybody involved. Uh, we've got some doctors on the phone, and. Basically, the result is we're getting Dan out of the Grand Canyon one way or the other, whether it's through a helicopter flight or a drive out of here. Uh, as you can see, the issue is massive amounts of snow. Uh, so this road is 45, 48 miles long, and uh, we've had tons and tons of snow this year. So uh, this cat, that rig right there is how the road gets clear. So that's gonna have to drive out first. There's concerns about that, that exit being too slow and that maybe the best alternative is a helicopter flight. We're trying to figure it out right now, but um, things are obviously pretty scary. Uh, hearing Dan in distress was really nerve wracking and we obviously wanted everybody to be okay. So I'm thankful that there's a team of people here <clears throat> that are able to provide medical attention and medical help. It's gonna be okay, but uh, definitely a scary situation. I'm doing a lot better. Are you? Yeah, they got an IV in me. They gave me like drugs, which is super good. Yeah. Drugs are always fun. Yeah. Legal, <coughs> yeah, legal drugs, drugs yeah. are always fun. Dan, love you, dude. You got me plugged in. You got my IV hanging here. That's right. Thank you guys, yeah. appreciate it. Send us a copy yeah. of the show. Take pictures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right on. Take care. Hey, thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You're the man, Jake. Thank you. Bye, Dan. When Dan finally did get to the hospital in Kanab, Utah, it was determined that he was suffering from rhabdomyolysis otherwise known as rhabdo. Rhabdo is a very dangerous and scary condition that emerges through extreme exertion. It is actually the muscles breaking down, deteriorating, and releasing a protein into the kidneys that poisons the kidneys. It is considered very serious, and it's also pretty rare. 
Thankfully, Dan did not get so far into the rhabdo condition where he will not be able to recover. If we had determined to continue on and try to make it back across the canyon, there is a good chance that the rhabdo would have devolved into a fatal condition and Dan wouldn't be here today. I am deeply thankful for the actions of the rangers and all involved who helped make the rescue possible. Jake and Emmett were amazing and we all banded together to make this what went from a scary situation to something that we can all learn from. I am obviously relieved that this did not result in a fatality and that Dan will have full recovery of his muscles and of his kidneys, but it was definitely close and it could have gone the other way. This was a learning experience for me. This was a learning experience for everyone involved. And I hope that you, the viewer, can also take something away from this and be better equipped for your backcountry adventures, for your risk assessments, for your decision making, and that you all are safe and uh, able to make it home at the end of your adventures. I do feel like I pushed the envelope maybe a little bit too far with this aggressive nature of a trip. And I am deeply thankful that it all resulted in us getting home safely and that Dan is recovering well and Dan is ultimately going to be okay. Whether or not he'll ever want to hike with me again, well, that's another story. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. I encourage you all to check out Dan's channel where he is also detailing in his story his experiences on this trip. If you have any questions or comments, please leave your comments on the channel here below the video and I'll try to respond as much as I can. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate this one. This one was a tough one for me and uh, I'm just thankful that uh, we're all okay. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. 